uh, Ambassador, uh, members of the Consular Corps, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Baker Institute this evening for a presentation on the importance of transatlantic uh, relations, especially given today's challenges in the international arena. Uh, before I introduce uh, Ambassador Wittig, I want to do a little uh, advertisement. I would like to take a, a moment to mention that every year the Baker Institute hosts a number of distinguished speakers and events. And recently, as you know, we had Secretary of State uh, John Kerry here last week, Ambassador Wendy Sherman's, uh, Deputy Secretary of State Bill Burns, Paul Volcker, the Cuban Ambassador, etc. Uh, we're glad that you are with us tonight, and if you are interested in attending future events, you might consider joining our roundtable and our young professionals and emerging leaders groups. And so please contact us if you are interested in becoming a member of this uh, forum. Um, and now for the substantive portion of tonight's program. Uh, this is a complicated time for transatlantic uh, relations. Chaos in the Middle East tensions with Russia, Eastern Europe, the Syrian refugee crisis, the threat of terrorism, and major economic issues continue to confront both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, these have been exacerbated by domestic and regional uh, political factors that may make cooperation even more difficult across the Atlantic. These issues cannot be addressed without strong leadership and cooperation between the United States and Europe. Robust transatlantic relations are absolutely critical to resolving international crises and achieving shared goals. But too often, in the recent past, effective cooperation has been difficult to achieve. So in this context, we are honored to have our distinguished speaker, Ambassador Peter Wittig, with us this evening. The ambassador is certainly no stranger to this complex geopolitical landscape. Since serving as ambassador to Lebanon, which we served, we just exchanged reminiscences of our uh, assignments to Lebanon, I much earlier than the ambassador, and Cyprus, uh, where he was uh, between 1997 and 2002, he has been heavily involved in Germany's role in the United Nations, serving as the German Foreign Ministry's Director for United Nations Affairs and Global Issues, and later as Germany's Ambassador to the United Nations during its tenure on the UN Security Council. In April 2014, he was appointed Germany's Ambassador to the United States, which I assume must be the most important diplomatic posting, if we can be vain in that respect for the German uh, state. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Peter Wittig to the Baker Institute Forum. Ladies and gentlemen, um, Ambassador Gerardjean, um, thank you so much for your kind introduction, and uh, I'm flattered by your nice words, all the more so they come from such an outstanding uh, fellow uh, colleague, um, as Secretary Baker himself has called you simply one of the best diplomats I know. And we, two of us, we served at different times in the Middle East, so um, I feel a lot of commonality with you. Um, and uh, it's a huge honor, uh, really, to speak um, to you here this, this evening. Um, and it's wonderful to be here. It's my first time that I'm in Houston, and I uh, just come from the NASA Center. Um, and I'm still quite overwhelmed at what I heard there about uh, black holes and asteroids and, and the speed of light and learning also that um, the university here um, is highly renowned for its hard researchers, space scientists and nanotechnologists. Uh, it's sort of a little bit intimidating for me. So please don't ask me about astrology or physics. I feel more comfortable on this grounds of the Baker Institute uh, it's familiar terrain uh, for me, and I'm happy that so many people are in this town interested, apparently, in uh, foreign policy. And just as um, Secretary Baker tried to build a bridge between the world of ideas and the world
world of action by establishing this institute. Was it 20 years ago? Um, I too look forward uh, to engage with you uh, today in the same effort. And ladies and gentlemen, I might um, in this time of uh, an unprecedented turmoil that our world is in, maybe start with a piece of good news. The cooperation between uh, the United States and Germany, the two countries in question here, is, is excellent. Uh, probably as good as it's ever been. And it's certainly true of a particularly a close relationship bet between our two leaders, President Obama and, and Chancellor Merkel. But it also applies to uh, the two foreign ministers, uh, Secretary Kerry and German Foreign Minister Steinmeier. Best buddies is how uh, a German newspaper described uh, the relationship of the two. And one could easily apply this assessment more generally uh, to the uh, German uh, U.S. cooperation on nearly all levels of uh, the administration. The transatlantic engine is strong and multifaceted, and let me give you a couple of examples. Number one, in the fight against terrorism in Syria and Iraq, the U.S. and Germany have been important drivers in that global coalition against ISIL, the so-called um, Islamic State. Uh, my country is strongly supportive of uh, the peace talks on Syria that culminated uh, in a cessation of hostilities a few weeks ago, uh, an agreement uh, that is far from perfect and very fragile as we, as we have witnessed in, in the last couple of weeks when uh, this hostilities uh, picked up again in and around uh, Aleppo, basically, uh, because of uh, increased fighting and attacks by the Assad regime. But this agreement is a basis, we hope, uh, for a longer lasting um, ceasefire. And this is what our two countries are working at. And as we speak, um, there is a preparation for another meeting of the International Syria Support Group where um, U.S. is in the leading role, and my country is also a very active member. And both our nations are striving hard, using political and diplomatic means to bring down the Islamist terrorism and to end the atrocities in the Syrian civil war and, and to stabilize the country. Second example, um, the Iranian uh, nuclear agreement. After a very tough and lengthy negotiations, the P5, as we call them, the five permanent members of the Security Council plus Germany, P5 plus one, have reached an agreement with Iran that will, as we believe, uh, prevent the country from developing uh, nuclear weapons. We are now tasked, um, the P5 plus one, to strictly monitoring, uh, to monitor the implementation of that nuclear agreement. We are the kind of watchdogs that Iran is not cheating. And we are also um, monitoring uh, the recent Iranian elections. Um, they will, uh, as we believe, probably strengthen the reformers in Iran and hopefully, step by step, open up the country, and especially the young Iranians, which are uh, almost a majority in this country, um, bringing them closer to the West. This does not mean that we are turning a blind eye on the negative role uh, that Iran is playing in the region, in Syria, in Yemen, in some of the Gulf countries, uh, nor are we turning uh, a blind eye on continuing uh, Iranian aggression, such as the rec recent missile tests, and uh, we have to um, answer uh, uh, and find an answer on, uh, on, on those events. But um, in general, we believe this is an opportunity um, for, for um, uh, the region in the long term. By the way, Israel's security is non-negotiable for us. This was also always on our mind when we negotiated uh, this agreement. 
Another example of close cooperation between uh, the US um, and uh, my country is our approach towards Ukraine and our relationship with Russia. Uh, Russia is our giant neighbor. Uh, we have to live with it. But in 2014, uh, uh, things have changed with the annexation of the Crimea, and we entered into a new chapter of European history. It was a, a fork in the road, really. The US and um, Europe did not always agree on that mixture between deterrence and detente, or stick and carrots, if you will. However, we jointly countered the Russian aggression with a strong and very effective sanctions regime. Um, uh, and our two countries support the so-called Minsk process. The Minsk agreement was co-negotiated by Chancellor Merkel together with um, French President Hollande and President Putin and Poroshenko in Minsk. And we hope that this Minsk process could eventually lead, and we need patience for that, to a peaceful settlement of the conflict in eastern Ukraine. In Eastern Europe, uh, those countries at the eastern rim of NATO that feel threatened uh, by Russian behavior, we have drawn red lines and given assurances to our allies. Our joint message to Putin is clear. We do not seek confrontation. We seek a partnership based on trust and the respect for international law. But there are limits, and we are very prepared to defend these limits as well as our allies. Now I give you another example of um, a cooperation between our two countries, um, uh, and, and, and this concerns trade. Um, we aspire, um, both of us, to conclude uh, TTIP, that's the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, a free trade zone between the biggest trade blocs in the world, Europe and the United States. That's currently under negotiation. And it has the, pon uh, the, the potential not only to boost transatlantic trade and investment, but also to serve as a blueprint for the global trade system as a whole. We have the chance to shape the way trade is done in the future on a global scale, to shape globalization, <coughs> to write the rule book for trade relations. And this is probably uh, one once in a generation chance that we should not miss. I know and I've uh, observed with a certain astonishment that free, free trade in the campaign has become uh, a very controversial, even toxic uh, issue. It's not a very popular thing to say, but I believe that um, free trade has benefited our two countries, has benefited in, in, in particular my country, and, and we would be well advised uh, not to let this opportunity to conclude a free trade agreement uh, slip away. Equally, on another topic, um, the US and my country in particular worked well together, and that's on the issue of uh, climate protection. Um, the US uh, and my country were instrumental to conclude a landmark agreement uh, at, at last year's uh, UN climate change conference in Paris and ensuring a long-term transition to clean energy, energy solutions. So our cooperation between our two countries, between Europe and um, the United States, is certainly far from perfect. And there are areas where we need to do more. And the refugee crisis, and I'm elaborating a little bit on that issue because this is the number one issue in my country, maybe the number one, number two, number three issue, and it has really plunged Europe into quite a existential crisis. This crisis that started last summer has hit Europe quite unprepared, um, and um, in particular my country. Uh, Germany took in 1.1 million refugees uh, in, in 2015 alone. 
Uh, and if you, um, you know, compare that number, or if you um, uh, uh, put this uh, into an American context, it would be roughly the equivalent uh, to the U.S. taking in 4.4 million uh, asylum seekers in one year. So that's a sizable number. Um, and they speak for themselves. Um, uh, it is clear this is a human migration of epic proportions. We are witnessing worldwide um, 60 million or people that are on the move worldwide, and our neighboring, uh, uh, our neighboring continents, uh, from a European perspective, the Middle East and North Africa are unstable. They are almost um, fragile. And that's why people are on the move. And Europe is their first, and in particular, my country is the first destination uh, of, of their uh, movement. It's probably the most um, daunting challenge that Europe has to face since the Second World War. And it's self-evident, as our resources are limited, although we are still a very prosperous country, our absorption capacity is limited. Also, the acceptance of the population to take in many more refugees is limited. We have to reduce, reduce the number nationally, but also, also through international cooperation. We have to do many things. Harmonization of our asylum laws, a joint protection of our common European borders, and that's very important, a fairer distribution of the refugees in the European Union. Um, it, it, it is unsustainable if only a couple of countries, Germany, Sweden, and a couple of others, uh, bear the brunt of the burden. So the deal you might have heard about recently with Turkey, Turkey being the gateway of the refugees coming from Syria between Turkey and the European Union, and a maritime NATO presence now in the Aegean Sea, those are first steps of a joint European effort uh, to fight human traffickers. And it's, it's notable that many of the Syrian refugees or refugees from Iraq co are coming with the help, the help of the human traffickers, which has become a multi-billion dollar trade. So we've got to stop uh, the human trafficking and deter uh, refugees um, um, taking the deadly risk of crossing the Mediterranean. However, uh, we have um, to take uh, many steps, but it's also um, the refugee crisis is also an international crisis. Granted, the US is currently uh, not as affected um, as it is, and it is, is in a comfortable situation of being able to sharply limit uh, the number of refugees from the Middle East, but it has also become a transatlantic issue, and I think for the U.S., the instability of Europe is cause for concern. In a way, only in a joint approach um, that addresses the root causes of the refugee influx will we be able uh, to solve this crisis. And especially um, that means working towards a settlement of the war in Syria. That's the main root cause, people fleeing the war, the civil war in, in Syria. And improving uh, the situation in the refugee camps in the region, in Lebanon, uh, in Jordan, and in Turkey. Um, it also entails the distribution of the refugees, acknowledging that we all have a humanitarian responsibility for the refugees on an international level. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you um, I would start with a positive message um, at the beginning, so let me now be a little bit more critical when I'm looking at the um, uh, situation, um, at transatlantic situation. The solid basis on which our strong transatlantic relations rest, our 
common closely knit values, our, our common tradition, the achievements that we have in, in the post-Cold War order, the fall of the wall, by the way, a, a great achievement, the reunification where the US, James Baker, uh, President Bush Sr. played such a instrumental role. I cannot stress enough uh, how, how grateful we are as Germans to President Bush and, uh, and, and Secretary Baker. I think this was one of the greatest moments of American statecraft in the last century, having realized, as only Americans can do, that this uh, movement of people uh, yearning for freedom, and, uh, for freedom is unstoppable, and they realized it earlier than some European leaders. Realizing this, that this is legitimate and unstoppable, and then channeling it, steering it in the right direction, and firmly embedding Germany in a, in, in a European and NATO order, and everything without one shot that was fired, um, th that is a, um, that was a masterpiece of diplomacy, uh, and, and I cannot applaud um, the two leaders um, and their aides, and you were probably, you were not, uh, you were probably in the Middle East, right, at, at that time, but I, I, I cannot applaud President Bush and, and Secretary Baker enough for that um, great achievement. Now, to come back uh, to today's world, we cannot only live on that uh, sort of heroic uh, narrative uh, of the fall of the wall and our common values. We have to realize, and we mustn't lull us into complacency, there are, especially among uh, young people in, in Europe, um, there, there is a widespread view that sees America not only as a land of opportunity, but also a, as a threat to personal privacy and data protection, and, and sometimes consumer standards. So that's a big issue in, in, among the young generation in Europe. And on the other side of the Atlantic, we find uh, a seemingly, as it seems uh, sometimes from a European uh, perspective, lack of knowledge about Europe, a kind of indifference um, towards European and German culture beyond the World War II and luxury uh, premium cars. Um, so, um, by the way, this is one of my core um, assignments in Washington that I want to present uh, my country beyond the Oktoberfest, uh, you know, <laughs> culture, and, and, and convey that we are a modern country uh, full of innovations and ideas and a land of free college education, by the way, which is um, an important asset, I would say, and, and you know, modern cities full of life and, and culture, like, for instance, Berlin. Besides, our two societies are changing. Uh, with the immigrant populations growing in both of our countries, we also have to come up with a more nuanced image of each other. A Hispanic American will understandably be less attached to the history of the Cold War in Europe. And uh, just as, for instance, a young Turkish immigrant in Germany will have much looser connection to the role of the, the US liberating Germany from the Nazis and ending the Holocaust. So um, the, the horizon of, of those young immigrants is a different one. It's, 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 it's something we have to take into account. We need to do more to spur our people's interest in transatlantic relations and foster a true transatlantic dialogue, especially, especially among people of the young generation. So what are these new topics, uh, these new themes? What can take us to a transatlantic dialogue 2.0? Immigration and integration must become one of the central topics. While America has been known always as a melting pot that succeeded in integrating multitudes of people of different origins, ethnicities, and religion into the American way of life, it is lesser known that Germany and Europe have also grown into societies with substantial 
immigrant population. In, in our country now, 20% um, of the population have an immigration background. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's quite astonishing, and it happened all in a very short amount of years. Um, and our respective strategies and approaches in dealing with the immigration challenge can be beneficial to both sides of the Atlantic. And I'm always telling my uh, fellow uh, German countrymen, we can learn a lot um, of the US approach to diversity. Besides, um, both of our countries have mastered different aspects of modern innovation and technology. Silicon Valley, and I'm sure that also goes for Texas, has been unsurpassed in IT, information technology. While German engineering remains um, le leading um, craft uh, in the world. US college education, and I'm, I'm not saying this to flatter you here at Rice University, US college, education is envied all over the world. While the German vocational training um, system for skilled labor, um, combining on-the-job training and education has become a role model for many countries in the world. So looking for synergies and cooperation in this field will not only boost innovation and economic progress, it will also bring young people closer together. At the same time, when talking about the opportunities of modern technology, we need to have a deeper exchange. Who owns our data? How much access should Google and co. have to one's privacy? How should they handle personal information? What are the limits of government surveillance and bulk data collection? Those are issues that are on the mind and uh, of, of, of many people, at least in, in my country, especially young people. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, you see the field that defines the transatlantic partnership is rich. It's not restricted to lofty speeches uh, delivered by diplomats in this case, on the importance of transatlantic ties, but it t extends to thousands and thousands of people-to-people -people contacts. And my point is maybe less and less government-to-government -government relations matter in this globalized world, but it's also people-to-people -people contacts. Students, young people, uh, scholars, scientists, business people, cultural, and social figures, and of course, uh, political leaders. And these ties especially depend on us, all of us, and especially on the young people to fill them with life. And with those words, I close my remarks, and I thank you for your patience and um, your attention. I um, would be um, you know, uh, thrilled if we could have a conversation. Thank you.